Welcome back to Sci-Fi 2020, uh, to the final session of day four. Uh, we've had uh, fantastic conversations uh, over the past four days, uh, engaging with some of the most important questions from data governance to the um, importance of privacy, to the role of the pandemic in changing the way we appreciate technology, uh, to the challenges of the emergence of China, 5G, apps, and other important areas of investigation and research. Uh, this afternoon, we are joined uh, by a stellar cast to discuss Europe and its twist with technology. Uh, the future of digital Europe in many ways is going to shape our common digital future. And uh, it, this is a region that must, in some sense, put together a formula for all of us uh, to embrace and uh, to discuss the possibilities of such a formula emerging from the old continent we are joined by Prime Minister Karl Bildt. Uh, uh, joining him will be Anna Maria Ursula from uh, Tallinn. She is a senior policy officer at Guard Time and a researcher with the Tallinn Institute. We have Marine Guillaume. Uh, she is the deputy to the French digital ambassador. And we are hopeful that before we close this conversation, uh, uh, Regine uh, Greinberger, uh, the German cyber ambassador, will be with us in this conversation as well. Uh, Karl, let me begin with you. Uh, and let me make three statements and allow you to respond as you choose. Uh, the first statement, there are doubts on uh, convergences and consensus within the European Union on how they will approach uh, the, the future of technology, the future of the digital world. Uh, is digital EU something that we should look forward to? Or is the politics and economics of Europe so divided? The digital consensus is impossible. The second, uh, the transatlantic relationships are challenging EU's capabilities to make choices uh, between the devil and the deep sea. Europe is undecided on the technology future it should opt for. And the third statement I'm going to make is that because uh, the EU was largely an economic project, commercial interests have uh, precedence over security interests. And therefore, the questions around security and politics take a back seat when we discuss technology. Carl, over to you. My three big statements, you can choose how you want to respond. And I said it was just a, a pleasure and honor to be with you and be able to take part in this uh, successful conference. I remember when it took place in physical form. That was even better, I have to say. But we are where we are. Sabi, you had quite a number of questions. And I will try to answer them fairly briefly. Um, starting towards the end, you say EU was primarily an economic project. No, it wasn't. Uh, the European Union was essentially, it's always been a political project, which has to do with stability, peace, harmony, reconciliation, you name it, uh, on a continent that has seen quite a lot of the opposite. Economic integration is one of the means that we have for the political, but economic um, is not the only thing. We have a far-reaching integration on justice and home affairs and on quite a number of other issues. But it's true, you are correct. We are not a military alliance uh, because the military essential basic security of the European, this part of the European continent has been taken care of primarily by NATO. So the purely military issues have been outside uh, of the EU for a very long time. There are some overlaps, but, but, uh, but anyhow. Then we are 27 nations nowadays, it used to be 28. We are at this day um, in a final or one of the one of the eternal final moments in the Brexit negotiations, uh, see where that ends up. But we are 27 different nations uh, and it, uh, it goes without saying that there are all this discussion about everything, as it should be. It's a fairly dynamic and vital uh, political environment that we have. That includes every sort of issue under the sun. Uh, I've, I've been part of that for X numbers of years, and I can vividly remember all the discussions that we had in the European Council and the Council of Ministers. Uh, do we normally come to an agreement? Yes, we normally do. Uh, is it quick? Sometimes. Um, is it always? No. Uh, does it take a long time? Sometimes. It certainly does. Uh, but um, nearly always we manage to find a compromise or meeting of minds and an understanding of the sort of slightly different points of view that might be. On the digital issues, to go to those, yeah, there, I think they are different, somewhat different. If, if you listen to it, it sounds different from different uh, angles. I mean, we, 
I shouldn't speak for France, but <laughs> um, if you listen to the French, we'll see, uh, um, the word autonomy uh, comes in uh, fairly often. Uh, it's not a word that we use. Uh, we talk about capabilities and competitiveness and those sorts of things. Um, so we sort of somewhat different philosophical approach sometimes. Does that mean that we don't agree? No, we normally manage to find a compromise in spite of the fact that the philosophical wordings coming out of a different cultures can be somewhat different. Um, uh, that's a somewhat upbeat uh, assessment of the European situation. Then uh, I belong to those that believe that we have to do far more. I, I wrote a piece the other day where I said that the European Parliament has declared a climate emergency because we need to do a lot of the green stuff. I said we need to declare a digital emergency because there's a risk of us falling so gravely behind both Americans and the Chinese. And uh, that will require quite a number of steps in the next few years to, so that we can catch up with. The Americans have been there for a long time. The Chinese are developing fairly fast. Carl, thank you very much for your initial thoughts. And I'm going to come back to you on nearly always reach a compromise. And if that's good enough, when we deal with a binary political proposition coming from Beijing, is compromise something we should be thinking about? And uh, I'm going to come back and ask you, a couple of questions on that. But let me turn to uh, our French colleague who was invoked by Carl. Maureen, let me ask you a question. Um, do you believe the shaky nature of the transatlantic partnership, uh, you know, the Trump politics, uh, the American democratic moment, in some ways is uh, a reason, one of the drivers, why Europe is not necessarily either coherent or confident of taking a political stand when it comes to the difficult uh, questions around te the, uh, our technology future. I mean, we have heard from the UK and the French and some others on delaying or, or moving away from 5G technologies by 2027, seven, eight, nine years ahead. But we are not seeing a very confident and coherent European, common European approach on dealing with um, some of the important questions we need answers to. So how do you see it sitting in Paris? Well, uh, first, let me thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, with regards to your very uh, difficult question, I think um, the way France is looking at this, um, let's say, tension that you mentioned with the uh, Trump administration, or at least the, sometimes the decision that we are not very um, aligned with, I would say that it's an opportunity, and I think uh, we see that as an opportunity, and a lot of European partners see that as an opportunity. Um, we need to build uh, our digital future, and it needs to be a European um, digital future, which means that we cannot uh, rely on the US or on any other states like China or whatever, because we need to be uh, those who have uh, our destiny in our hands. So uh, that's true, you're right, Minister Bilt, we sometimes friends spoke about autonomy, but we can also use other concept because at the end of the day, I think we, are, we agree on this idea that we should uh, be uh, in the capacity to make our own choice uh, and uh, our own decision. So anything that could um, lead us to do that is a good thing, a good opportunity. Uh, that is why what's going on right now with the transatlantic side and also with China and all the debate about the technology is at the end of the, of the day a good thing. It's um, it's uh, we need to priori prioritize uh, digital issues, and I very much like the idea of of uh, of, uh, of um, doing this digital emergency uh, uh, because we need to to put uh, more uh, energy on that. Uh, we saw that the, the the Parliament wants to do so, and we are very happy with that. So we need to invest now, and everything that will lead us to do that is a good thing. So I'm not sure I'm answering uh, your question, but that's how I would say no, it. Let, let me ask you a follow-up question quickly. Um, sitting in France, do you believe that uh, the entire sweep of the 27 countries Carl referred to uh, can arrive at a common position on making some difficult choices around, let's say, the 5G um, uh, business model? Uh, do you think that you have the Hungarians and the Polish and the Czech and everyone else in between uh, on the same page in taking a, a decision uh, that is going to secure European interests? Well, I think as Minister Bilt uh, said earlier, 
that Europe is not only an economic project, it's a political project with uh, collective values uh, embedded in it. So uh, we, we don't know how long it will take to, uh, to, to gain a consensus, but uh, we will work through that, we will thrive to that. And I guess that we have some, some, I think everyone agrees on the fact that we need to be more powerful and to be more resilient. And to do so, we need to rely more on European actors. So at the end of the day, we believe that uh, uh, so, uh, a kind of agreement can come, come out of that. Uh, how long? We don't know, but we will work for that. Okay. Uh, let me turn to Anna Maria um, Estonia. Uh, and, you know, you've seen uh, Estonia um, in many ways the, the digital first country of the world, not only of the union, but certainly of the world. Um, uh, we have envied your progress and we have admired it from India, in, in the Estonian story. Um, we, of course, have come up with a, uh, with, a, with a slightly different, slightly crazier Indian version of it. But I think, I guess the Estonian model still is the gold standard. How do you assess the future of a society like yours, which is so deeply integrated with the digital? How do you see this geopolitical moment playing out for a, a smaller community like yours, uh, which will have to make choices in the coming days? Uh, US, China, uh, the bigger European actors. How is a country like Estonia gearing up for the, the tech age where geopolitics will indeed be digital? Uh, thank you for the great question and uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me uh, back to this great conference. Um, I think Estonia is a great example of uh, how small nations can be good testing grounds for interesting innovative solutions. So in that sense, we couldn't really compare India and Estonia. But of course, it also uh, shows, and we have learned this the hard way, how dependent we are in, uh, in, uh, on these solutions. And perhaps uh, one thing that has uh, become evident that is really relevant uh, for a nation like Estonia that is uh, uh, small in compared to the capacity uh, comparing with bigger nations is the relevance of cooperation in the sense of, for example, sharing information. And this is something we again experienced uh, not, not too long ago when it came uh, about uh, that there were certain security flaws in certain technologies um, and chips related to our national ID card. So this is really the backbone of this digital society that uh, we are, so to say, boasting about. And now we were in a situation where we did not receive this information as quickly as we wanted to even though uh, we are all part of the European Union and we should all be really cooperating very closely. So I think this is one, one of the uh, key areas that I see here that is relevant uh, for uh, smaller states like us. So close cooperation with our partners, not only within the EU, but also outside, because sharing information about possible vulnerabilities, possible attack vectors, etc., uh, is, really, is really vital. Um, as a second of all, I would like to emphasize the importance of uh, norms and rules, because I think that for smaller states especially, uh, adherence to norms, uh, not only within the EU, but also globally, um, is, is really relevant for us and is, is the, the mechanism that protects us. So in that sense, I really welcome discussions between uh, and member states, but also between uh, different countries in the world, uh, in, uh, for example, state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, so where are the red lines and, and uh, what is acceptable and what is not? And this really turns us back to the issue of trust, uh, which is, I think, one of the cornerstones of the discussions within uh, the European Union at the moment and one of the cornerstones of, of the digital strategy. So how do we gain trust? And this really relates to your original question as well about 5G. So how do we know whom to trust, uh, when to trust, and, and how, how do we know that this agreement that we may have uh, still stands, uh, let's say, in a year's time? So I think these, these are some of the important points. Uh, let me ask you a pointed question. I want to turn to uh, Regine Greinberger, who joined us. She was having connection issues, um, but we are going to turn to her very soon. I'm going to ask you a direct question. I'm going to uh, uh, allow Carl to uh, respond to something he wanted to respond to, and then move to Regine and ask her a few questions on the German discussions around the future of technology. But uh, Anna Maria, 
uh, has the mood changed in Estonia? You are quite bullish and excited about the potential uh, of the Chinese technology business. Is the debate changing in Estonia? I've been following Estonia. I've been hearing uh, and reading uh, from my colleagues, reading works of my colleagues from uh, that part of the world. Do you think there's a different discussion for in the last six months that's taking place post the pandemic? I think that um, Estonian um, different ministries and different entities are rather realistic about the uh, threats of dependencies on uh, specific vendors, be they Chinese, be they Swedish, be they uh, from, from anywhere. So in that sense, I think one of the key, uh, key points of the European Union strategy towards uh, mitigating the 5G situation is the multi-vendor strategy. So to make sure you are not dependent on one vendor. So I think this is um, one of the discussions that has, has been kind of underlining uh, the, uh, the approach of Estonia. And of course, uh, we welcome, and this is me speaking personally, I'm not representing Estonia here. Um, we welcome the risk-based assessment approach uh, by the European Union where each member state can uh, design their own um, assessment of this 5G situation. Okay, uh, Carl, you wanted to come in and uh, just be warned that Sweden and China have been put in the same basket. So you will have to rethink your own digital diplomacy in the days ahead. Carl, over to you. Yeah, I, I, I think we need to have a bilateral discussion of a serious nature about this later on. <laughs> um, no, I, I, something I just wanted to point out when you talk about the EU as a digital. Um, the digital issues are fairly new. Uh, the European Union has a far more elaborated structures for dealing with agricultural issues because that's been that's been the core of the Union for a long time. There are a number of fields where we are not completely, we don't have a functioning digital single market. Uh, we do have problems with the free flow still uh, in the data space. We have an ongoing discussion about privacy and how far that should go. We don't allocate spectrum uh, together. That is a national sovereignty. And that means that we don't have that unified 5G space uh, that, for example, the Chinese and the Americans have, which gives them an enormous advantage. Uh, we, are, we are lacking seriously behind in 5G deployment, for example, due to the fact that we are not unified. And this has to do with history. Uh, these are steps that we have to be taken by the individual nation to sort of pool sovereignty with each other in Brussels. And uh, that we did with agriculture X numbers of decades ago, but we are not yet there all over the place on the digital space. I'm quite certain that in five years' time it's going to be very different from what it is today. In fact, that was one of the questions we had from uh, one of our uh, uh, audience members uh, this afternoon. Uh, that uh, that what has been the performance of the general data protection regulation uh, in a diverse union such as the EU? That was one of the questions, and I think you have, in some sense, answered it. That uh, we still have some way to go before even the data regimes are similar and cohesive. Uh, but let me turn to uh, Regine Reinberger here. Uh, uh, Germany is a special country. Uh, it is, in some sense, the economic and financial capital of of. Uh, uh, EU and uh, Chancellor Merkel is the Chancellor of the world. Uh, she is uh, admired in many parts and many geographies, and uh, and uh, you hold a special place uh, in, in many different countries. So let me ask you: uh, Germany seems to have a different and unique take on the 5G debate vis-à-vis -vis its neighbors in the Union. Uh, there is there seems to be tension between the Bundestag and uh, 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 the business uh, interests in Germany. Uh, are we seeing um, a, a, a consensus emerge or are we still in the early parts of debate, uh, security versus commercial interest? Where are we uh, sitting in Germany on this important question of the future of technology choices we make? Um, thank you for having me and thank you for asking me this direct question. Uh, directly into the middle of uh, a political and societal controversy that we have in, in Germany, indeed, in these days. Uh, on the one hand, commercial interests, but not only commercial interests, it's also a broader interest in where, where are we going to. And uh, the headline for this discussion is uh, digital sovereignty or uh, assertiveness of the European Union. We are thinking not only about 5G, but uh, also about um, 
where are we going with the European Union? Can we uh, defend uh, a place uh, between the big technospheres? Mm -hmm. can we, how can we uh, make sure that we are able to take our own decisions also in the future? Mm -hmm. Not only 5G, but 6G and other uh, critical technolo emerging uh, technologies uh, which will be disruptive for our um, for our development and for the for the for the daily lives of all our uh, 450 million cons consumers in the European Union. So it's I would say commercial is uh, is not um, is not quite the one side. It's the, the side that makes uh, uh, that is very uh, keen on um, on. Um, in establishing quickly 5G technology is not only because we think um, it, it's good business, but also because we think uh, it's a necessary step stone into the future. On the other side, of course, we have the problem of um, trustworthiness of the vendors. And we know and we have seen uh, in the last months and years um, several indicators that uh, show us very clearly that um, Trust is a really a scarce uh, good in, in the political relations um, with, uh, with, other, with other states, not, uh, not within the European Union, because uh, as Anna Maria said, I think we in the European Union, we are practicing uh, having trust in each other every day. But uh, with our neighbors and other regions of the world, it's, uh, it, it, it is an issue and we have to make sure that we are not naive and also in this case uh, digital sovereignty is uh, is the headline because only digital sovereignty will make us um, will put us in the position that we can also protect um, the rights of our citizens mm -hmm. the rights of our citizens for privacy to use uh, and keep their own data and so on so um, in Germany, I would say, of course, we are perhaps special because uh, the country is big and um, others are looking towards us. But we are not special because we have the same problems as other European member states. We have to take a decision, a national decision, which has a heavy impact on our critical infrastructure. So I would say it is normal that uh, our Bundestag and the government and also uh, the public is discussing uh, intensely uh, about what to do. But we will have a decision, I would say, um, in, this, uh, in this year, uh, in any case, uh, before the next elections, because everybody knows that time is running and we, we cannot spend years and years in discussing it, only we need a decision. So I think we will, we will go for a balance between um, uh, a quick um, implementation of this technology and, on the other hand, uh, possibility to uh, to put restrictions on uh, the companies that set up the infrastructure. Uh, Regine, let me ask you one more question before I uh, turn to uh, uh, Marine, uh, which is um, uh, when you mentioned digital sovereignty, there is also the element of uh, the big tech from across the Atlantic. Uh, how do you see that relationship unfolding? How is Europe going to respond to these large giants which are uh, which enjoy great market power and dominance, and uh, 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 how is the European ethic going to assimilate that reality in its fold, or are we going to see EU push back and uh, seek a redistribution of market dominance uh, in the technology sector? Well, um, there are several uh, roads to approach this issue. One is uh, that the Commission is preparing a Digital Services Act to regulate, especially the big uh, platforms. Uh, like uh, Google and so on, because they are also not only ha they are not only uh, collecting and using our data, they are also the gatekeepers to the internet for many people. Mm -hmm. So the Digital Services Act will will um, uh, will uh, establish some rules also for them when offering their services in the European Union. Um, so this is uh, one one way to approach it. I would say um, that. Our model, European model of digital sovereignty, does not mean that we want European champions for everything. We just want to make sure that when they come into this big internal market, which offers um, business opportunities for everybody, also for the big tech companies, they um, 
apply uh, the regulation that is uh, that that we that we set up. So uh, the, the European model is not a model of autarky or of um, of self-reliance. Uh, it's uh, of self-sufficiency. It's a model of openness, open trade, open uh, economic area, so that um, um, we we can uh, we can we can do business together for the profit of everybody. And I heard, for example, uh, last week that Microsoft, uh, one of the big uh, tech companies, is also interested, for example, in coming into our European cloud project. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, they will have to um, to uh, obey then the rules. Uh, Marion, you were nodding your head vigorously in agreement. Let me uh, ask you uh, uh, the same question: that how are you seeing the relationship between U.S. big tech and EU? play out over the coming years. But most importantly, uh, digital sovereignty is incomplete if Europe does not have its own tech champions. How is Europe working towards building its own technology companies that have global reach and influence? Well, uh, th thanks for the question. So I was indeed nodding the head because I'm totally agreeing with what uh, Regine just said. Um, uh, it's really not about having um, necessarily European champions like a European Google. It's not that we are looking for because first Google is probably too good uh, and too far away that we cannot fill the gap and create, a, for example, the French, um, the French exactly the same actor as Google. We need to think about um, the domain where we can uh, create a new champion uh, that will. Uh, that will be good, but not because it's European, but because it will be good, because it will have the capacities, the function, the, the resources that make it a very good actor. I think this is the end of uh, uh, something that Europe pursued, which was, uh, okay, we have a Google, uh, which is very good, let's create exactly the same player and let's uh, let's try to, to do that. It's not like that, that innovation works. Innovation works where you are the best because you, you have the ability to be the best and not because you are uh, sponsored by, by, by your state. Um, so that's something that is very important for France and I, I think for Europe. Um, Regine mentioned a lot the concept of digital sovereignty and I think this is something we are really working on. So how do you, how do you uh, achieve sovereignty in the digital space and you need to have of course actors but you also need to have uh, to um, create the conditions to um, let's say um, uh, try to uh, disable the monopoly of the your American actors for example and to do so you have two ways either you try to create a, a, um, a, um, a place where you have a um, the capacity for everyone to innovate and that's what the Digital Services Act wants to do and it's great but always maintaining openness of course but create the condition for everyone to try to raise and there is a second way that we are exploring right now is the capacity to be to create uh, digital commons mm -hmm. the commons I know if you uh, know what it is it's a it's it's a way to try to uh, 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 leverage the power of the of the big actors and create uh, actors which can, uh, thanks to to the multitude and to everyone, be as good or at least uh, challenge the, the the big actors. And it's something that is open uh, to everyone and which is useful to anyone. So this is something that we want to promote in France and and hopefully at the European level. And I think that's something that uh, India would find very interesting because it has its own vision of digital public goods and working towards creating common intellectual property pools that can in, enable small and medium enterprise and, and industries. Uh, Carl, um, digital sovereignty. Uh, I, I want to take a different spin to that. Uh, it's not uh, defined in the European document, but uh, we have discussed this at the Global Commission and you have, of course, discussed this in many other fora that you participate in. I'm going to ask both you and um, uh, Anna Maria, uh, how serious and real is the threat of uh, political interference by outside actors using the digital domain for the EU. Uh, we have seen uh, election interference in the US. Uh, some argue that uh, digital platforms have exerted uh, more than uh, necessary influence in Indian elections. We are seeing regimes being destabilized and delegitimized uh, using fake news, misinformation, disinformation, and, and um, uh, certain disruptive operations. Uh, how seriously does EU see this threat uh, since we talk about sovereignty, I think this is perhaps one of the single most destabilizing possibilities in the near future. Is EU beginning to prepare capabilities to tackle this? 
Oh, it's uh, it's fairly clear that that particular threat is there. Uh, I think there's somewhat less surprise about these things in Europe than in the US, because if I look sort of at our experience, uh, we've been subject to what used to be called in the old days propaganda uh, by outside actors for <laughs> decades, for generations. Um, it used to be television, radio, leaflets. Uh, now it's in digital domain, and the the actors are normally the same. Um, but of course now they, they can do it in somewhat different ways than they used to do it in the past. Um, and we need to be alert and we need to have our own information space. Uh, not that we block them uh, because we are free societies and the freedom of speech is uh, a very sort of important part of that. But that we uh, have the trust of uh, our citizens when it comes to the information that is available in our information space. Uh, but clearly, yeah. Uh, there's propaganda directed against our country as well. Um, Estonia, take a nearby country, yeah, they have their fair share of it. Um, but as long as you have a resilient and credible democracy, you're normally able to handle this. Um, are you are you uh, of the view that democracy, I mean, Marikya Shake, one of our common colleagues and friends, has often stated that uh, will technology be the undoing of democracy? Will technology undermine pluralism? Is that something that worries Europeans, or is it uh, American? Uh, yeah, Marika and I are normally on the same line of everything. I think she's carried that slightly too far. Um, I think all of these technologies. I mean, we have seen the one technology leap after the other from the printing press and onwards, and they have always been fairly destabilizing. Uh, no question about that. Uh, have they long term contributed to more open societies? Yes, they have. Uh, and I'm a great believer in the fact that the information, the freer you make it, it erodes a uh, closed society over time. Uh, it can also be used by closed and authoritarian societies. We see that in, in uh, primarily China, well, not only China, but primarily China. Uh, the Russians are somewhat less successful. They're trying hard, but they're somewhat less successful. Uh, but over time, I think they are having a losing battle. Um, let me just add one thing where I have a slight, I wouldn't say disagreement, but another nuance. I, I, I never use this digital sovereignty because I think uh, when I listen to part of the European debate, I think we are too keen on regulate and too bad at innovate. And I think we should focus more on the debate, not on the technologies that Americans have already developed and the Chinese, but on where are we going to be 10 years from now? Where are we in artificial intelligence? Where are we in quantum computing? Where are we to be somewhat nearby in fintech? And make certain that we have the research and development and the innovation space in order to be there ahead of the game, instead of only being those that regulate afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because the, the risk with that particular process is, I mean, GDPR is an example. It's a good one, essentially. Uh, but it has the effect, of course, it's a very complex, too complex. It will have to be subject to review. Uh, the Facebooks and the Googles, they can throw thousands of lawyers at this and sort it out, and they do. It's not a problem. They can handle it. But if I take a small and medium-sized startup in the fintech sector in Sweden, uh, they are crying and screaming uh, because it's so bloody complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know firms who've been moving to the US uh, because they find the innovation space better, because they find it too regulated now. That, that's a balance that we must be very careful with, so that we um, don't make the innovation that we need. That's an important point, and I'll come to Regine with that same question. Is uh, uh, Europe the story of uh, over-regulation of technology? But before that, let me uh, ask Ana Maria, uh, is it time to uh, regulate content? Uh, do Facebooks and Googles and, and YouTubes and Twitters uh, threaten democracy and, and uh, the public sphere, the, uh, the, the, pure, the purity of, of conversations of the past? Or do you think this is another medium which will eventually find its own uh, balance? Uh, thank you. Before answering to your question, I would I would echo on what was said before about uh, whether cyber attacks are actually being a threat um, when it comes to the and I completely agree to what was uh, said by Minister Bill before, that of course it's a threat. And I think that the European Union and different member states are being, at least from the perspective of Estonia, very realistic about the possible consequences. And I think what we need to pay attention to here is the relevance of uh, ensuring the integrity of data and processes. 
because data is in the center of all the digital plans and initiatives that European Union is rolling out. And the EU has said itself that the cornerstone of making this uh, successful operation is making sure that we can rely on the data. So not only data as in databases, uh, but also processes that are being defined. So in, in this way, I think we need to underline the relevance of uh, disruptive technologies, which give us opportunities uh, to ensure this integrity. But now to your question regarding content regulation. Uh, this is really a hot topic now, uh, especially when it comes to large uh, platforms and, and tech giants. And I think that uh, we see a trend uh, moving uh, towards regulating this more, so giving more liability to large platforms when it comes to illegal content. For example, Twitter um, recently said that it will start actively policing for political advertisements. So I think this is a trend we will be seeing also with other platforms um, as we go. Uh, Regine, do you want to come in on both the debates, regulating tech or creating tech? And how do we manage the uh, post-truth world? How do we manage the fake news menace that uh, inflicts all of us around the world? Um, thank you. I would like first to come in at, uh, with, um, with a creating a space for innovation uh, issue. Because, of course, I talked a lot about regulation, but innovation indeed is more than the other half. It's, it's more than a half of the, of the whole thing. And um, in these days, um, as the German presidency, we try to finalize the negotiations on two important instruments that will, um, that will help create this innovation space. Uh, the first one is our regular multi-annual financial framework, uh, EU money which, um, which will be spent in the next seven years and um, there is about a 133 or something billion euros uh, spent for, digital, um, for, digital, for digitization, for the internal market, for innovation and research. It's an important instruments, uh, instrument. It is also uh, taking in the, um, uh, the efforts of uh, third countries who are partners, for example, for Horizon 2020, our uh, research funding instrument. And this is a lot of money and there will be a lot of projects also being financed with this money. And the other, um, and the other uh, instrument is, is the um, recovery, uh, recovery EU. Um, uh, instrument, uh, especially to come out of the uh, uh, corona crisis. Uh, this is money that will be spent uh, during the next uh, two years until 2023. And there is also 140 billion euros for digital, uh, for the digital agenda of the Commission. So there will be a lot of money and not only money, but also a lot of projects that can be leveraged with this money. And I think uh, this, will, uh, this will help us uh, to, um, to, to create this innovation space that we really need. We need it not only in, in, in the sense of uh, infrastructure, software and so on. We need also um, the formation of talents, I would call it, experts. Uh, digital experts, cyber experts who can, um, so that we can uh, not only uh, take over innovations from other regions of the world, but also create our own. It's very important. Um, uh, there's a qu there are a couple of questions that I want to uh, pose, uh, one of them to Maureen and then uh, the others to uh, some of the others. Uh, the, uh, there's a question by Martin Stewart uh, and Maureen, perhaps you can try to uh, uh, respond to this. How do you reconcile championing uh, digital sovereignty, but counter si cyber sovereignty in the discussions on responsible state behavior in cyberspace? So how is your uh, uh, narrative of digital sovereignty sufficiently different to the narrative of cyber sovereignty that the Chinese and Russians have uh, in some sense uh, uh, in the recent past? Um, uh, thanks. The question is excellent. It's, uh, I would say it's quite simple. The idea is that we remain open. Sovereignty doesn't mean to be closed or doesn't mean that you mm. want to uh, exert a type of uh, social control over your population or that you want to uh, um, keep the data uh, and, and take a look at the data. Sovereignty also means just making the choice by yourself, being able to de decide on your future. So it needs to be secure, uh, to be uh, able to innovate. 
to have strong norms that protect the the, the, free, the, the rights of your citizen uh, and to have strong infrastructures, but it doesn't necessarily mean to be close and, and to, to promote something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, only uh, working for your citizens or that is um, exerting social control over them. I don't uh, know if it answers the question, but... No, no I know. I, I think your answer is that cyber sovereignty is an exclusive arrangement. Digital sovereignty is an uh, open and inclusive arrangement that welcomes uh, others to participate uh, 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 through a rules-based framework. I think uh, it's probably what you were uh, alluding to. Uh, let me turn to Carl. Carl, there's a question again from Aisha Dev. Do today's regulations prevent tomorrow's manipulations? Is the key not in regulations, but in creating more flexible systems? We know the extent of algorithms in people's lives. Should they be flexible? Should they be editable, editable to be truly democratic? Is algorithm accountability and is, uh, is uh, uh, flex regulatory flexibility important to sustain digital futures? Uh, I mean, the, the, the short answer to that is, of course, yes. Uh, I think we should be aware of the fact that we are in a very rapidly evolving technology environment. Everything that we are discussing now will look somewhat old fashioned five or 10 years down the road. Um, there will be more flexible, there will be more adaptable uh, options available to all of us. Um, is is, I think is the EU regulatory framework flexible and adaptable? That's a question I think that's directed to you. Well, I think this uh, innovation space is not regulated. Um, there will be innovations coming. And then the question is, where will these be deployed? I mean, the risk that I see if we regulate too much is that, yep, we can innovate to a certain extent in Europe. Uh, but when I see sort of the startups, uh, when they think that after the second round, they have to go to the US uh, because the capital markets are not too deep in Europe or because the regulatory space is so, the, that's the danger. Um, that doesn't mean that these things will not be developed. They will be developed and they will be deployed, but perhaps first elsewhere than in Europe if we are not careful. And it doesn't mean that they will not be used by the European consumers because they can access them by VPN or whatever, wherever they are in the world. I mean, uh, that's why this sovereignty discussion, one should be sort of aware of the fact that it is an open space. I mean, I can access with a click a server wherever it is in the world and access whatever service they want to provide me with wherever it is. Uh, in that sense, flexibility is there. Um, but I think for the key thing for Europe, uh, because we have a lot of talent, no question about that. I mean, we, are, we are not bad in talent. We are not bad in basic research. We have innovators that are fantastic. There are areas that we're clearly ahead of the game in terms of the technologies. But we are not good in deploying the technologies, in developing them, in uh, sizing them up, in having capital markets, in having the innovation space. Uh, that needs to be deployed, that needs to be improved in a fairly radical way so that we can compete with the Americans and the Chinese and the Indians, who could be very dangerous further down the road. Okay. Uh, Anna, you raised your, Anna Maria, you raised your hand. I want you to come in. Uh, yes, I wanted to echo on, on the topic of regulation. Uh, of course, I agree that it needs to be flexible um, and moreover, it needs to be uh, technologically neutral. So the regulation that the EU is to, is to propose and is to adapt needs to be made in a way so that it wouldn't um, push aside any future technologies that are to be become more uh, uh, popular than they are today. And uh, yes. Uh, and I wanted to um, also ask you something that um, you had mentioned in your uh, first uh, responses to me. Uh, I want to place a scenario before you. Uh, if we are meeting again in a couple of years at sci-fi, two years from now, uh, will the European 5G debate look a bit like Singapore, middle of the ground, have Chinese components in certain parts of their uh, uh, industry, uh, re uh, remove them from other parts which are more critical, or would we see a more binary Europe, which is uh, uh, you know, free of uh, certain vendors completely and has embraced a certain different section of suppliers? Uh, Marine is laughing. I'm going to come, uh, come to her as well with this question. So, uh, Anna Maria, over to you. First, I really hope that in two years' time we will meet in person, not looking at screens. <laughs> uh, second of all, uh, of course, it's very difficult to, uh, to predict the future. I think, um, again, referring back to, to the current uh, EU policy on this matter, 
I think uh, we should maintain a versatile approach uh, to these technologies. And I don't believe personally that outright banning uh, anything is, is the right way to go. This also reflects uh, to what Marine was saying about uh, being open, uh, maintaining the, the concept of digital autonomy or digital sovereignty at the same time being open to different, different technologies and, and different suppliers. Marine, you want to chip in on this question from the audience on the future of 5G in Europe, Singapore or Australia? Where are you going to be? Uh, I, I wouldn't tell. I wouldn't say. I just would like just to add uh, add up on on what Anna Maria just said about the fact that uh, uh, at the end of the day, banning uh, actors and uh, is is not is not a good thing because uh, Europe promotes something that as an open internet, open unique internet, and the more you exclude some actors, uh, the more you ban them, and the more you create, you reinforce a fragmented internet, and this is not something that we want to have. So uh, that, that, that's the remark I wanted to So even make. your response is keeping your options open. I'm going to turn to Regine. Uh, we, you know, we have seen a recent uh, proposition from UK. We have also seen the uh, alliance uh, come about in terms of AI. Do you think digital uh, futures is going to be shaped by democratic coalitions? Do you think the idea of a D10 or uh, like-minded countries agreeing and working towards uh, principles and, and norms, uh, uh, something that is going to define the shape of uh, technology governance. Uh, do you think there's an importance of this democratic coalition to, uh, to emanate or emerge if uh, we need to trust in tech and if technology is going to preserve society as we seek to keep it? Uh, of course. I mean, uh, democratic uh, cooperation is in the DNA of Germany. It's also in the DNA of, uh, of the European Union. And I think this is the way forward. We have to do it together or we will not be able to do it at all. Carl, I'll, uh, final word to you as we close this uh, particular session. Um, uh, what is uh, the potential and possibility of uh, EU-India partnership? Uh, in some sense, both of us are smaller than the two big giants in the, the playing field. Uh, but we are important actors in our own separate ways. Is there a potential and importance of an EU-India technology partnership that moderates the extremities we are seeing uh, uh, in the two ends of the world map? Well, on, 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 on two levels, certainly. I know there's a dialogue between India and the EU concerning sort of the global, global regulation and global things. I mean, all the things that are now on the table in the United Nations, where I think it's important that those nations that are states that are democratic that we try to find a common language and here i think india is an absolutely critical partner in that particular effort then i can see it from the swedish point of view you have to take two companies ericsson of course uh, I'm, I'm slightly biased uh, but ericsson has been in india forever and has a significant research facility and significant interest in India and our interest in developing that. A small company that is headquartered, as a matter of fact, two blocks from I am today, called True Caller, you mm -hmm. might know it some here, is gigantic in India, gigantic in India, uh, in spite of being developed sort of a two blocks from where I am at the moment. And we have also an inflow into town. I, I see far more Indians. Um, in Stockholm nowadays and that has to do with the fact that the biggest single profession in this town today is a programmer and we don't have enough of them and and uh, so we have a fair amount of Indians and others coming in here spending some time here and then going back to India so we have a rather thriving digital relationship developing which I think is only the, in the beginning. So thank you very much uh, actually I'm uh, not going to try to um, put together uh, the key takeaways, but I'm going to just share one thought with all of you as we close this session and close day four of the conference. Um, it, is, it is apparent to me in the last um, 16 sessions or so that we have hosted digitally uh, that there seems to be a, a reluctant but uh, uh, upward uh, trend that is making democracies and plural societies begin to recognize technology as a domain that requires more attention. And I think the term Carl used, digital emergency, uh, it may sound alarmist, but I think it perhaps is a flag that must be raised occasionally because I think governments need to find more time and resources uh, for this sector. The second trend is also apparently clear, 
that uh, in a world where the multilateral system is dysfunctional, uh, regional orders and a series of regional orders may be the interim arrangement uh, as we discover uh, what is on the other side of this period. And therefore, the European EU model, the EU uh, offering the EU proposition, be it on digital sovereignty, or maybe if you, are, if you can finally discover a creation and innovation model, uh, we would uh, greatly benefit as a global community. So the essentiality of uh, this regional powerhouse, EU, cannot be uh, overemphasized. I think it is very, very important that digital Europe emerge, and it is equally important that India uh, is one of digital Europe's most important digital partners. Um, uh, uh, we will have you back with us and on different occasions, but let me thank you on behalf of the organizing team for your time, for your patience, and for connecting with us this afternoon. We will be putting out uh, this conversation on various platforms and we will share it with both the presenters and with the audience. Uh, thank you and stay tuned for day five tomorrow morning. And uh, uh, from all of us at Sci-Fi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.